Hi guys, welcome back to Anna Dialogue, the dialogue on analog musical production. Even though, once again, today, we are going to talk digital. Actually, we are going to take a look at one of the most important, one of the best, most renowned vintage CD players, which comes at an excellent price. Let's take a look. Okay guys, as you've seen from the title, we are going to take a look and try to understand the Marantz CD94 Mark II. Very important, very not very different from the one, but much better. So um, we're going to talk a little bit uh, of the main features now. Then we're going to take a look at the physical aspects of the player. And then we're going to do a special listening test. Uh, from two different perspectives, and then my final take. Are you ready? Let's start. Okay, guys. Now, first of all, I those of you who have been following me maybe saw a connection here, maybe saw a path that I'm trying to follow. Now, I did a few weeks ago a video dedicated to the best CD transport, or at least my search in that. Here's a link. And in the end, I purchased a Jay's Audio CD Mark II. Fantastic transport. I loved it. I tested it out. And in the end, even though I did not did a, a complete burn-in, uh, immediately after the well, immediately after the first weeks of usage, I uh, classified it as an excellent player, better than my Oppo modified Audiocom Signature Oppo BD. 105 connected to my main all of audio may my DAC kit kitsune tune edition i mean everything by the book top notch but it wasn't sufficient so i sent it back i did further research and apart from the models i presented in that video once again take a look at it i started to pinpoint other fantastic models and a few of these still maintain incredible price tags. But there's one model, not one, well, I'm sure there are other ones, but this is one of the top best, absolutely, I mean, uh, ask anyone, vintage CD players that unfortunately you can still find at a decent price. And it has a few main characteristics that just put it at another level. And we're gonna try to understand why. Now here, as you can see, are the main specifications. Nothing special, fantastic uh, numbers, but something normal for a CD player, actually. What are the main characteristics here that we will also see in video afterwards? Well, uh, first of all, I wanna say that this machine was produced between the end of the uh, 80s, around 1988, all the way at the beginning of the 90s, uh, around 1991. And it was just below one step, the top model of Marantz, the CD7. Although the CD7 already has a different and worse transport, as we will see. A little more noisy, according to a, a few. I don't, I never tried, to, tried it, tried it out, so I can't speak for that. In any case, a lot of people prefer this, and it cost one third current price I'm talking about, eBay, Hi-Fi Shark, things like that, okay? So I wanted something in that sector. I didn't want it to go completely high-end. Maybe in another video I will, because I'm looking also for another player, uh, probably the verdicts of what is CD reproduction, but I'm still hunting. Now I want it to go of once upon a time, top of the line, and now at a decent price because I got it obviously used and I got it for uh, refurbished from an uh, audio um, hi-fi store, so that's pretty good, around 900 euro, which more or less I would say is $1,000, a little less. But I saw it for less, actually, for cheaper. Also, I saw it for more. So we are in that ballpark and I think that's an excellent price considering the fact that the quality of the components of the sound does 
absolutely face stand up to what we can find uh, in the in the shops today but we'll we'll get back to that at the end of the video so what are the to die for features now first of all the cd transport ah, one of my favorite of all time the cdm1 by philips a die cast zinc piece of zinc and iron uh completely anti-resonance obviously fully dampen uh with a swing arm which means all a, a number of things i i want and i think the best is to get a classic cd red book player no buffering if you buffer if you're using a CD-ROM, top of the line today, all oh, use CD-ROM. You don't have any more of the swing arm. That's gone. The J Audio did, but it's new old stock. And fine. In fact, if a few models have it, it's new old stock because it's not produced anymore. CD-ROM has buffering, so it reads a lot of times. Interpolation is surely getting better at that point, even though in these early models, we have less filtering than now. And it stores that data and then it reads it back. You have these passages that leave a signature in sound. I know a lot of you are just going to think I'm crazy. But do take a look at my other videos on CDs where I report scientific papers. Not Don't take just my word for it. But it's not just ones and zeros. I mean, come on. We're, we're out of that now, okay? I mean, only if we we're talking about interpolation. That changes a lot the sound signature of each machine. So forget the mumbo jumbo of get a five dollar player and hook it to a quality DAC. no absolutely no but we'll get back to this so uh the cd1 also has this fantastic lens by Rodenstock, which still today is the verdicts of that type of production i mean we have these incredible over-engineered piece of equipment that are just a dream in fact um the the chief of marantz the japanese genius Ken Ishiwata wanted desperately wanted this type of mechanism inside, but they weren't producing it anymore at that time. So he had to re-elaborate his own a nightmare. Any problem didn't reach that pinnacle. Obviously, the mechanism is just one single part of a player, and that's not sufficient to say it's a quality player. You need also much more stuff. And in fact, we do. One of the main aspects is also the DAC. Obviously, we're talking about a ladder DAC. We're not absolutely in the domain of Delta Sigma or things like that. That's going to come afterwards. Here, we still have ladder DACs, which now are coming back, obviously, because people are understanding what is pleasant in digital. And we have this very famous renowned the TDA 1541A S1 single crown. The, there, there are two, they work together, and these are ICs that have been three times selected to be the top of the top's performance. So the, you have the selection, that's why they get that single crown, and this type of model, which was maybe the first one to get this pinnacle, the verdicts of this type of DAC by Philips. Top of the line, top quality. Uh, a lot of people describe it as very analog type. I, I hate these comparisons. Analog is an analog, digital is digital. In any case, I understand why. Uh, and in fact, if you immediately want to have a clear idea of what we're talking about, take a look at that recent video, actually my last video, on my audiophile disc tests, the best, best sounding CDs. I was using this Marantz for all the, the, the different um, playbacks, although I was using the headphone output, not the best, and I was just put, plugging it into my camera, not the best. In the test afterwards, that's why that was a little secret, but I can tell you now, we're going to try the direct output from the RCA um, outputs in the, in the behind, in the rear, connected to a proper converter. A sound card so everything is done a little better and we're also going to do that the signal coming from the player going through my uh, holo audio make it's on tune edition uh, and you're gonna try to understand the differences i don't want to say anything as i said at the end of the video then obviously i will tell you my take my opinion on this 
Okay, so uh, I think we can take a look now at the physical characteristics and then come back on one more comment on the inside. Let's go. Okay, guys, here we are with our nice vintage CD player, the Marantz CD94 Mark II. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the remote control, I, and that's a common issue. Uh, I also know that practically all the Marantz CD players have their own remote control, but that specific remote control can be used also in the other models of that period, of that era. So if you find another um, uh, remote control of another model, it's probably going to work with this one, no problem. Or you can program another one, not that big of an issue. Okay, let's try to take a look at the main features from the front. Then we'll talk a little bit about the back of the inside, and then we're going to do a test. Okay, here we have this nice large power button with also the compact disc logo. So let's turn it on. Here, as you can see on the side, we have these uh, wood insertions. Very nice. Afterwards, I'll turn it around to show you a little bit better. And here we have very basic commands. Open and close. Love that sound. Here we have the FTS button, which is, there's a lot of features actually connected to programming. And this is to select the FTS, your favorite track selection. Obviously, uh, back and forth between the tracks, play, replay, pause, and stop. And these, as you will see, light up in, in, with, uh, in consideration of the different functions. Actually, we can already see something. You're not going to hear the sound. We're going to do a test afterwards. As you will see, it starts immediately. Very nice. I didn't press play actually. So let, let's try again. You put a CD, you just press play. There you go. Ready to go. Very nice. Pause. As you can see, we have these nice light blue and light orange colors. And then you just stop everything. Here below, haha, <laughs> secret features. Now, all this, the timer, this one all the way to nine and zero uh, buttons, the select, memo, cancel, recall, all this is to program. I mean, if you want to change the, um, the order or simply the play specific tracks on specific CDs, you can do that here. You can program uh, hundreds actually of CDs. I don't know why someone would take the time to do that, but maybe on a radio station or things like that, that could have been helpful. I couldn't care less, actually. I love to hear a disc from the beginning to the end. Here we have a headphone output, very nice, with its own level. I like it a lot, very useful. Actually, I used this output in that video where I presented the, my uh, audio file test discs. And here we have other basic commands like lap remain, which clearly shows you the difference between the lapse time or the remaining of the whole uh, CD. Shuffle mode to listen to different tracks in a different order. Here we have a button called AB, which will loop, will cont continuous play a precise selection you have made. Repeat at a specific track. AMS, it will repeat the first, not repeat, it will play the first 10 seconds of each track of a specific CD. Rewind and fast forward, so you can navigate through a, a, a track. Plus also index, because in some cases there were, I don't think they're doing it anymore, but I'm not sure. There are, there are CDs with tracks which have sections inside a track, so you can navigate through those sections also. And that's it. Now let's take a look at the rear. Okay, here we have the rear. As you can see, we have two SPDIF digital outputs, optical and coaxial. Then we have the analog outputs, a heat sink, a little bit of information, a voltage selector, which in some cases I think I saw also uh, US, Japan versus EU type of selector voltage. Here it's only 240 or 220, which doesn't change that much actually. We have the fuse, the external fuse, which is good if you want to change it. 
And as you can see, we do not have a fixed power cable, which usually takes place in these types of um, decks of players. In this case, we have a two pole. And in fact, I highly recommend a, a, a dedicated quality cable since you can. And I got a, a AudioQuest Energy Z2, which works perfectly and greatly enhances the quality, I must admit, of the playback. Otherwise, use a normal cable, but if you, if you do a comparison, it's rather uh, clear what's, what's happening. The, uh, the quality just increases on all the spectrum. Uh, I will put um, a link in the video description, or at least the name of the model, don't worry. Just want to show you very quickly the side of these beautiful wooden panels. Very elegant, very slick, something typical of that period, late 80s. Uh, mid 90s we have this fine wood with this lacquer very very dark but that gives that extra nice little fancy touch okay guys so this 12.5 kilo baby is starting to communicate his quality i think because if you look at it it's kind of humble i mean it's not that fancy champagne metal face plates or things like that it's very simple, although there was a champagne edition, a limited edition champagne color, which actually maybe I must admit is a little more cooler than this one. But this is the true one, the original one, the 90s lookish, simple kind one. And I like it. Uh, let's take a look now inside a little bit. Uh, I actually already told you a lot about the, uh, the single crown, the TDA um, DAC, the ladder DAC Van Phillips. Uh, which, once again, a lot of people are going crazy for this and they are um, disassembling them from these units and they're trying to put them in other units or they're modifying this model, the CD94 Mark II, and introducing more new stuff, a lot of mods, taking away the oversampling because unfortunately they did oversampling in these models. Uh, trying to bypass the oversampling, trying to change a few of uh, the, the capacitors and all different little mods to upgrade and bring this uh, even at a higher level. I like to keep it with its original sound signature. As you can see, we have a fantastic array of discrete components. All the PCB boards are separated for the analog stage, the digital stage, the power stage, the control stage. Uh, incredible a transformer, uh, beautifully done, nice and tidy in order. I mean, you can immediately see that we're looking at something at another level, very, very high quality. And once again, a lot of people are really after this still today. Okay, so now we're gonna play a little game. I'm gonna play the same track from the same CD twice and it's gonna be converted once by the TDA 1541A single crown ladder deck by Philips. And the other time it's gonna be converted from the Holo Audio May Key TA, okay? I'm not gonna tell you which is which. I'm just gonna put random the two tracks, a good minute of it. So put your headphones on, focus, concentrate, and try to see what are the differences because it's not just a matter of quality. It's also a matter of we could say generations. The 90s sound, even though this is very peculiar, very high quality and distinctive sound, not something typical of the 90s actually, but one of the most important of there and emulated by others, and the cutting edge of today. And try to see the differences and obviously try to understand which one you prefer. And obviously afterwards I'll tell you which is which. Let's go.
Okay, guys. So, are you ready? Pause the video. I'm going to reveal which track is which. Okay, so, the first playback was the May, the Hollow Audio May, okay? The second one was clearly the TDA 1541A single crown. So, what are the differences? Well, I'm going to start to say something uh, from my opinion. Now, I want to say immediately from the start that I prefer the Holo Audio. more pleasant sound, more rich, more, I would say, faithful to the original recording. I mean, no question there. Nevertheless, there is something very appealing, sexy, I would say, of uh, the TDA 1541. Ooh, I don't know. It, it's really, I understand why they say it's analog, because it's round, it's supple, it it's just pleasant, easy to, to follow, to, to, to listen to. But at the same time, it has a decent amount of resolution, not the amount of resolution, and I would say also dynamics of the holo audio. Okay, and that's just another level, in my opinion. But I do understand why they a lot of people are after that. It is a very special, warm, distinctive, round sound that really... Uh, calms those uh, those very accumulate that very sharp edges of cd playback sometimes and this is an excellent solution if you like that kind of sound i like a little more detail and i like a little more contrast between uh loud and soft noises that's why i like more the main but it's normal so in the end i guess i did get a cd player and not a transport as a lot of you guys said actually yes true i think a transport is always going to be better because it has less electronics and what's inside is dedicated only to send the digital signal directly to the DAC. it's obviously going to be better and more focused and less noisy in any case there are obviously as you can imagine vintage transports absolutely i've showed you some in that video so uh, in the future i will definitely try also out those but i must admit that this guy is gonna stay with me and we'll see in the future what's gonna happen i have i just had to because the difference the emotion that got me that reached me when they turn it on is something that just moved me immediately i have the sensation uh, i don't know if you know what i'm talking about but when you have that further step close to what is the true recording or what is true sound it just moved me it just all of a sudden, oh, it gives me the shivers. It makes me emotional. And I didn't have that with the Jay's audio. With this, immediately, it was just a, a magical connection. And the more I listened to CDs, the more I wanted to put inside. And I'm purchasing your, your uh, indications, your suggestions in that other video. So a lot of you are probably going to wonder, what are the difference with your Apple since you had your Apple for so much, for so much, for so many years? It's going to stay with me for high resolution media. The Oppo is fantastic. It's a digital, it's a modified Audiocom Oppo. Okay. It's different. I just want to make sure you understand that very high quality, but for CDs, this is a winner. Absolutely. And what are the differences? Well, it's just a bigger sound. It was right more close to me, more into focus, nice and etched, rich with details but nice and supple, warm, round, because it does give that sensation, even though, and I'm talking about the emotions, I'm having the perception of the, of the sound with the May, okay, not with its own DAC. And uh, the resolution was there, but at the same time, it wasn't that sharp, that edgy, that coldness of digital. It was a little down, a, a little softer, undertone and i like that a lot it was just more i know i use this word a lot engaging it immediately caught me more my attention and brought me in the middle of the of the of the music uh, and the sound was bigger uh, i never can say there's a large sound stage 
a large display uh, with digital. I get that with analog a lot more. But nevertheless, the, 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 the results were very pleasing. And you have this big deep sound also because it, I, it, I do think it has a coloration in the lower register. I mean, the, the bass is so strong and deep. Sometimes it's even too much. So I think that it does have a coloration regardless of its own DAC, even if it goes through the main. Another indication that the whole mechanism, the whole structure, the whole electronics do have their imprint on the final sound, even though you're not using the DAC. Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please let me know your comments on other vintage models of this period, late 80s, early 90s. I'm interested. And what else can I say? Music is born analog. Well, guys, if you're enjoying my videos and you're enjoying my channel, please consider to subscribe by clicking the black and white logo here below. Also, don't forget to click the notification bell so you'll never miss an episode and you will become a true member of the analog community.